Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Chiron Horman? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the incident, and then I'll offer my analysis. Starting with the background, Kyron Horman was born in Portland, Oregon on September 9, 2002. His father's name was Kane Horman, and his mother's name was Desiree Young. Because of the many shared last names for people in this case, I will be using their first names to refer to them. Kyron's parents were married, but they divorced when Desiree was eight months pregnant with Kyron. Initially, his parents had shared custody, but in 2004, Desiree developed a medical problem, which necessitated Kane taking over full custody. She had to receive treatment and couldn't care for Kyron. Kane married a woman named Terry Moulton in 2007. They had been romantic partners since 2001. In December 2008, Kane and Terry would have a daughter. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. We go to June 4, 2010. That morning, Terry takes Kyron to school. They arrive at about 8.15 a.m. She stays with him during a science fair in which he was participating. She took a photo of him that the authorities have verified is real. Some people have said it was photoshopped. That is not the case. The photograph of Chiron taken on June 4, 2010 is real. It was the last photo of Chiron that was ever taken. She stated that she left the school around 8.45 a.m. Her last memory of Chiron was seeing him walking down the hall on his way to his first class. Nobody in his first class saw him. He was marked absent for that day. Here's what Terry said about her activity after leaving the school at 8.45 a.m. From that time until 10.10 10 a.m., she was at two different grocery stores. After that, until 11.39 a.m., she was driving with her daughter. Now, her daughter was about a year and a half old at this time. She was driving her around in the hope that the movement would help alleviate an earache that her daughter had. After doing this, she went to a local gym and exercised until about 12.40 p.m. By 1.21 p.m., she arrived at her residence and posted images of Chiron at the science fair that she had taken that morning. Kane and Terry went to the bus stop to pick up Chiron at about 3.30 p.m. The bus driver informed them that Chiron was not on the bus. They needed to call the school, which they did. The secretary at the school said that Chiron had been marked absent. The secretary called 911 when she realized the implications of her discussion with Terry. The search effort for Chiron started immediately and went on for quite some time, but Chiron was not located. As the search continued in late June 2010, investigators informed Kane that Terry had offered the couple's landscaper money to kill him. This offer allegedly occurred in January of 2010. The police had the landscaper talk to Terry while wearing a wire, but she didn't say anything that incriminated her. Kane filed for divorce on June 28 and was granted a restraining order. In July, the police talked to a friend of Terry named D.D. D. Speicher. On June 4, D.D. D. was at a residence doing gardening work when allegedly she abruptly left at around 11.30 a.m., not returning until 1 p.m. Somebody at the residence called her to tell her to come back for lunch, but she did not answer the phone. Allegedly, at some point, Dee Dee helped Terry obtain a cell phone that was untraceable. Dee Dee has denied any involvement in the case. About two years after the disappearance, Desiree Young filed a lawsuit against Terry, alleging that Terry kidnapped Kyron. In October of 2012, Dee Dee was deposed as part of that lawsuit she refused to answer 142 different questions. In 2013, the lawsuit was dropped. At the time I'm making this video, the police have not named Terry as a person of interest or as a suspect. No charges have been filed against her in connection 
with this case. Chiron has not been found. Terry appeared on the television show Dr. Phil in 2016 and denied any wrongdoing. We see an interesting discussion between Terry and Phil McGraw. Here are some of the items they talked about. Terry posted a message on Facebook about hitting the gym tomorrow, four days after Chiron's disappearance. She claimed that law enforcement told her to do what she would normally do. She also accused law enforcement of being corrupt. Phil McGraw pointed out how 26 days after the disappearance, Terry was involved in quite a bit of text messaging with a potential or actual romantic partner involving discussions of sex. She explained her behavior by saying the person she was communicating with was Kane's friend. She did it to get revenge on Kane because he was doing the same thing. She also said that Kane set her up. Those two excuses really don't seem to align. Now, some people believe that Phil McGraw was victim shaming or victim blaming. After all, Terry has never been charged with anything. So she lost her stepson. She is a victim. I think what Phil McGraw was trying to do here was point out how this behavior seemed to be out of character for somebody who just lost their stepson. Although I can't understand why some believe that he was victim shaming or victim blaming, because he really seemed to emphasize the sexual component of her messages. He seemed really focused on that. But again, I don't think any type of victim shaming or victim blaming was what he was trying to do. They talked about how she failed two polygraphs. So here we go again with Phil McGraw's nonsense about polygraphs. There is nothing scientific about a polygraph. A person cannot fail or pass a polygraph. It's nothing more than an intimidation technique supported by pseudoscience. Terry indicated that she's not sure why she failed because she was telling the truth, although she did indicate she has difficulty hearing out of one ear, and that may have caused a problem. There's something humorous about hearing these two argue about the varying levels of validity of polygraphs. It's like fighting over who is smarter, the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. If it's not real, why even argue about what it could mean? Terry admitted her marriage with Cain was not happy, but it seems as though she still kind of minimized how bad it appeared. She said there was no murder for hire plot. That was something that never happened. So that story about the landscaper, that wasn't true. And she said that Chiron might have been kidnapped by a man in a white pickup truck. In addition to what I mentioned before, we have seen a number of other allegations in this case. Here I'll cover a few that specifically relate to the day of Chiron's disappearance. Again, these are allegations. Witnesses saw Terry with Chiron leaving the school that morning. Other witnesses spotted a person sitting inside Terry's truck outside of the school. Terry washed Chiron's jacket and backpack on the day he disappeared. The police cannot find the items that Terry claimed to have purchased at those grocery stores. And Terry had an injury on her leg below her knee. It was a gash. She said she dropped a weight on it at the gym. I don't know how much I really trust these particular reports, but they may be of some interest. Terry has been described as charming, giving, well-educated, also demanding, controlling, and strict. She worked as a teacher and in a restaurant. She was into weightlifting and bodybuilding. In 2005, she was arrested for DUI. She pleaded guilty to reckless endangerment instead of DUI. With all this in mind, and looking at the information available on the case, do I think that Terry is guilty? Let's look at the factors both for and against the idea that she is guilty. Here I will try to stick with the credible reports, although it is very difficult to tell what's credible and what's not in this case. So looking at the factors for her guilt, she was responsible for Chiron that day. She took him to school. If she didn't take him, who did? During some of the time when she claimed to be driving around trying to ease her daughter's earache, her friend Dee Dee was unaccounted for. Also, just that alibi seems suspicious. It's convenient because it's difficult to verify. Other reasons that seem to point toward her guilt, the allegations I've mentioned before, like the murder for hire allegation, the untraceable phone, witnesses seeing her, 
Taking all this together, it doesn't look good. The timing of the disappearance, along with what appears to be the failure of her marriage, is suspicious. And of course, we get this general sense that she wasn't particularly cooperative with law enforcement. Now looking at the factors against her guilt, so in favor of her innocence. We see no physical evidence that connects her to any crime. It's hard for me to believe that she could have been that efficient. Why would she take him to school and then kidnap him? Doesn't seem like a very good plan. Her limited criminal history is not consistent with murder. This brings me to the last reason against the idea that she did it. It seems like in this whole mix of people, Cain, Desiree, Terry, maybe some different lovers thrown in the mix, there's a lot of animosity. Maybe most of it formed after the disappearance, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of anger. I'm not automatically convinced that Terry was the worst one of this bunch. Maybe Terry only seems bad because everybody's looking. Many lives are chaotic messes filled with animosity and strained romantic relationships. We see that all the time. People make it seem as though Terry's situation is unusual and we should be alarmed. But actually, I don't think it's that different than normal. If the curtain was pulled back on any random couple, we may find the same dysfunctional dynamics. I remember years ago, after being disappointed by the 2001 movie Pearl Harbor. I normally like war movies, but not that one. I saw a review by Roger Ebert, in which he wrote, the movie was like the Japanese staged a surprise attack on an American love triangle. It's like Chiron's disappearance attacked this marriage and the other related people. After he disappeared, there was a huge focus on the divorce, a focus on the relationships. Everybody was looking for an evil operator from within. So there really wasn't much thinking that somebody on the outside could have been involved. Kind of, I think, as a reflection on how these people felt about each other at the time of the disappearance. So do I think that Terry was guilty? I thought about this a lot, and I was kind of back and forth on it. I really don't know, of course, but overall, I don't think so. She has no real motive, no evidence connecting her to a crime, and a lot of people who may have other reasons to dislike her were making accusations. This really adds up to quite a bit of doubt, at least in my mind. This is a terrible case. Unfortunately, whoever was responsible will likely never be brought to justice. Those are my thoughts on the Kyron Horman case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.